Hey everybody. It's me again. Jay, the delivery guy. If you're not familiar with me, or maybe you forgot, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. See, I'm not your ordinary sort of delivery guy. I don't work for Uber Eats, Skip the Dishes, or DoorDash. I deliver food, beer, liquor, cigarettes, and just about anything else you can think of to the citizens of Hollow's End. Provided you can pay cash on delivery, and you're not on our list of offenders. And when I say we'll deliver anything, I mean anything. Once I delivered a muffler. Another young customer paid cash to bring their school homework to someone, probably for the purposes of cheating. And those are just the tamest examples I can think of. Don't ask about the albino crocodile. May he rest in pieces. I've been accused of being ethically dubious, while one kid, who probably played way too much D&D, insisted on labeling me as chaotic neutral. In short, I do my best not to break the law. Unless I'm tricked into it. And that happens semi-frequently. I try to avoid the black market, but sometimes you just can't help it. It's right there off Main Street, and it's a killer shortcut. I used to work for a real low-life scum sucker named Doc, who had a monopoly in this business, and acted like a complete Scrooge, paying a measly two bucks per delivery. But now it's just me and my grandma Muriel running the show, since that one time Doc tried to kill us and we had to take the son of a bitch out for good. We're the only delivery service in town now, here in Hollow's End, and if you want to get something delivered to your door from us, you have to abide by the rules. Not trying to kill us being first on the list. Rule number two is just as obvious, and I've already mentioned it. You need to have cash. Don't expect to pay with debit or credit, because if you do, you're going to be disappointed. We don't even have a machine. Rule number three is less obvious, unless you happen to live in Hollow's End, or if you know about the horrifying shit that goes down here. No deliveries to subterraneans. If you're not familiar with those guys, you're better off. But basically, they're an underground cult who worship ancient oversized millipedes. We've had run-ins with them in the past, more than once, and that's why they've been blackballed for life. Despite the fact that they're phenomenal tippers. The subterraneans, not the millipedes. Apparently some horrible shit involving them happened to me once as a child, but my grandma refuses to tell me any more about it, and my memory has blocked it out entirely like a trauma my brain has buried. But I do remember when they tried to sacrifice Muriel and I in a ceremony in the forest a couple years back, after luring us out into the woods with an expensive delivery call. That wretched memory is still very clear and vivid in my mind. Which leads us to rule number four. No deliveries to the forest after dark. That's where the subterraneans live, first of all. They have an underground compound which is labyrinthian and extends maze-like beneath the forest for miles in every direction. But it's also where the giant millipedes rise to the surface to feed, particularly after the sun goes down. So most people try to avoid the woods, especially after dark. And if you're too dumb to do that, well, we're not going to bring you any pizza. It's just that simple. The radio crackled to life and broke me from my thoughts of company rules and ritual human sacrifice. Come in, rooster. Come in. Hen house calling rooster. Come in, rooster. Muriel insisted on coming up with new code names for us and changing the radio channel every single day like CIA spies. Don't ask me why. It's like she thought there were people out to get us or something. I don't like to get on her bad side, so I just played along. Uh, this is Rooster, Henhouse. What you got for me? I've got a back-to-back -back for you, Rooster. You ready? I'll give you the deets. Go ahead, Henhouse. I'm ready. First call is to 274 West Street. You got a pickup waiting for you there that you're going to deliver to 18 Elm Street. Okay, got it. Right, what about after that? You said it's a back-to-back? -back? There was a long pause. Oh, you're breaking up, Rooster. I'll talk to you more when you get over to 18 Elm Street. Over and out. I tried to get her to answer me again, but there was no response. This wasn't sitting well with me. Muriel could be sneaky sometimes when she wanted to get things done. Especially if she knew I wasn't going to go along with her plans. This had scheme written all over it. And I had a funny feeling I wasn't going to like this delivery one bit. Regardless, it was a quiet day and I needed the money. I put the key in the ignition and turned it forward. 
listening to the satisfying sound of the engine as it began to purr and cough and sputter, then settled into its steady laryngitic rhythm once again. That's a girl, I said, rubbing the dashboard. Just a little while longer, baby. We'll get through this together. One day at a time. It sputtered again, then stalled, as if to say it didn't like me touching it that way, and I apologized before getting it going again and driving off, leaving Randy's rotisserie shop behind. When I arrived at 274 West Street, I was surprised to see there were two foot soldiers waiting at the end of the driveway, holding up their hands to stop me. When I say foot soldiers, they were literally a foot tall and appeared to be made of plastic. They had been painstakingly hand-painted by the looks of them, and were holding very realistic-looking rifles. They reminded me of the little green toy soldiers I had played with as a child, except for their size and the paint jobs which gave them a more realistic appearance. Halt! Who goes there? The one on the right asked. Uh, Jay, the delivery guy? I answered. I was told to come here to pick up a package. Identification, sir! The one on the left asked, far down below my open window. I poked my head out to look down at him and saw he was holding his hand out, waiting for me to produce my driver's license. Sure. I pulled out my wallet and showed it to him. Can I park now? I don't get paid by the hour here, fellas. Go ahead, the one on my side said, then pulled out a tiny walkie-talkie. Sentry to home base. Gopher is on site for delivery pickup. Really? More code names? And did that little bastard just call me Gopher? I parked the car and got out, walking towards the front door of the house. Before I went up the steps, I did a quick double-take at the garden gnomes which had been arranged around the front lawn. Yep, those were definitely moving. They appeared to be working in tandem to create a new garden gnome, hacking away at a stump of wood with little knives and making a crude replica of themselves. Like a photocopy of a photocopy, it wasn't quite as nice as the original. One of them caught me looking, and I averted my gaze quickly as his bushy brow knit into a scowl. I knocked on the front door of the house, and someone came to answer it a moment later. The woman opened the screen door, smiling and holding a very large box in her hands. Oh, hello, you must be Jay, she said, readjusting the big box as if it were very heavy. I'm Blarian. Hey, nice to meet you. You got some place here. I've never seen anything like it. Oh, that looks heavy here, let me help you. I reached out to grab it, and she took a step back, keeping it to herself a moment longer. She bumped backwards into the wall behind her, and poked her head around the giant box to look at me. You'll have to be very careful with this, she said, raising an eyebrow. No speeding or taking corners too fast. This is an extremely fragile package. Not a problem, I said, trying to think of a way to reassure her before settling on. I delivered cake once. I made a gesture with my hands to show her how large the cake had been, and she gave me an odd look, slotting the giant box into my arms as if I had been adjusting them for that purpose. It was really awkward. But what can I say? I'm a weird dude. Okay. Can I trust you with this, Jay? It is very important that this delivery arrives at 18 Elm Street. Do not make any stops along the way. I got it. You can trust me, I'm a professional. I lumbered down the steps, trying not to trip or step on any errant garden gnomes, then tossed the large box into the back of the car. A weird noise came from inside that I couldn't identify. Backing out rapidly, I tried really hard not to run over the toy soldiers at the end of the driveway, and I'm 98% sure I was successful. I drove off towards 18 Elm Street, trying to ignore the strange noises coming from the box in the back seat but it was more than a little difficult. It sounded like voices speaking, whispering in low tones. Of course, the second place was over on the west side of town, across the bridge, so it took me more than 15 minutes to arrive at the house. It was a single-story home with a porch out front, the pillars and railing painted a startling bright white. The siding was a soft blue color, clean and freshly painted like the porch. Before I had even gotten out of the car, a stone-faced man came out the front door. The wooden planks of the porch groaned beneath his weight, and the steps bent under his feet as he came downstairs to greet me. The man's skin was gray, 
and in the light I could see he appeared to be made of rock. Hello there, young man. You must be Jay. I'm Mr. Livingstone. Nice to meet you, sir. I have a delivery here for you from... Actually, I'm not sure if your dispatcher told you, but... I'm actually going to ask that you take that package to a different address. You see, I'm merely a middleman in this exchange. Oh. Well, yeah, I guess she did say it would be... Splendid! So here, take this envelope, and once you're far away from my house, you can read the address inside... And take the package there without further delay. He was shooing me back to my car and eyeing my back seat as if the package contained a biological weapon. Hey, ow, ow, okay, all right, I'm going. So what's in the box, anyways? You're acting like you don't want it here for another second. Should I be worried about it being in the back seat of my car? Nonsense, it's just a big, silly box. You can go now. Thank you so much for your efforts. You'll receive a big tip when you deliver that package, I assure you. Mm, that part sounded good, at least. But part of me was still asking, What's in the box? I started the engine and drove off, watching the man's face in the mirror as he waved at me. Even in the tiny reflection, I could see the dread in his eyes fading, and the relief as I got further away. Whatever was in that box, it wasn't good. I was more than a little worried about the safety of the person I was delivering it to. Not to mention my own. Muriel, come in. I said into the radio. Come in, Muriel. There was no response. I looked at the clock and realized it was after quitting time for her. Despite her earlier professionalism, she had no qualms about leaving me stranded on a call if it was one minute past the end of her shift. Great. Just great. She was probably on her way to the casino. Which meant I was on my own yet again. I opened the envelope at a stop sign and looked inside, hoping there would be some money in there as well as the location of the next stop. Of course, there was no money, just a scrap of paper with some scribbled writing on it. The address was on the far outskirts of the opposite edge of town, on the east side of Hollow's End. <sighs> Perfect. In the back seat, the box shook violently suddenly, making a loud rattling noise. Then it settled and was still again. I watched it in the rearview mirror for a few seconds, then decided it was done whatever it was doing for now. Screw it, I said, putting the car into drive. I don't get paid enough for this shit. I drove off towards the east side of Hollow's End, my eyes drifting to the rearview mirror and to the box in the back seat. I watched it out of the corner of my eye, as the sinking feeling in my stomach grew heavier and heavier. The drive to the third house was more than a little nerve-wracking. The box in the back seat kept rattling and shaking, making noise occasionally like people were speaking back and forth inside of it. Tiny, high-pitched voices speaking with authority and whispering orders. Every time I stopped at a red light or a stop sign, I would reach back there and examine the box, making sure there were no holes or tears in the cardboard. Each time I found it was intact and breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, I arrived at the house, an old two-story home with off-white siding and black shutters. The siding had faded to a weather-beaten gray color with age, and ivy was crawling up the building on all sides, as well as a tangle of bushes that were growing far out of control out front. A rusted television antenna was jutting from the roof beside the chimney, looking ready to tip over and collapse with a strong gust of wind. The roof tiles were falling off, and the bare tar paper could be seen underneath in places. I parked in the gravel driveway and got out, taking the large box from the back seat and double-checking to make sure it was still intact. Whatever was in it, I didn't want it in my car for the drive home after my shift. That would be this dude's problem. After setting the box down on the porch, I knocked on the door. I thought about running away right then, like a kid playing ding-dong ditch, but decided that would have been unprofessional. And it was my personal business I was representing here. Even if I was delivering some sort of autonomous murder device. Not to mention, a little voice in my mind spoke up. There was that big tip Mr. Livingstone mentioned. He can't give you a tip if you run away. The rusted screen door was as worn-looking and old as the rest of the house, 
and the wooden one behind it squeaked loudly on its hinges as a man opened it. He stayed behind the glass of the screen door and waited for me to speak before saying anything. Hello? Magnus Lahart? I have a delivery here for you. I tried not to sound nervous. A delivery? A delivery. Oh, yes, I am expecting something. But this box is quite large for... Oh, never mind. Uh, bring it inside, please, would you? My eyes aren't what they used to be, and I'm likely to knock over a lamp if I were to attempt it. He swung the screen door open, and I reluctantly obliged. I really wasn't a fan of going into people's houses. When you live in Hollow's End, you learn to be cautious. But this guy seemed to be alright. Not to mention, inside was where most people kept their money. Can I get you a cup of tea? I have the kettle on, the man said, adjusting his glasses and pointing me towards the living room. I set the box down there with a sigh, straightening my back and stretching it afterwards. The damn box was heavy, and awkward, as if things were running around inside of it, constantly shifting it off balance. I'm okay, thanks, really. It's no bother. I rarely get visitors. I made some cookies as well. The smell of freshly baked cookies was in the air, and I couldn't help but want to try one. Still, part of me was saying to run, and get far away from this place, before whatever was inside that box got out. One of the flaps of cardboard at the top began to bend and twist as something tried to push its way out, straining against the packaging tape. But then it settled down again and was still. I really need to get going, I said as the man emerged from the kitchen with a tray of cookies. He handed me one and I instantly took a bite, and stuffed two more in my pocket. They were soft and warm, the chocolate still melted and liquid when I bit into it. Nonsense, you aren't going anywhere he said, setting the tray down on the table. With a motion of his hand, the front door swung shut, with a bang and a series of locks clicked into place all at once. A chain moved as if lifted by an invisible hand, and a heavy bar settled into slots on either side of the door frame to fortify it all. Tea? he asked, pouring us each a cup as if nothing had just happened. I was suddenly wishing I'd use the restroom at the rotisserie place before coming here. He slid the cup of tea over towards me, and I looked at it distrustfully. You're going to tell me who sent you. Oh, and I'd also like to know exactly what's inside that box. I can detect something, but I'm not entirely sure what it is for some reason. It's strange. Uh, the delivery? You said you were expecting something. This is probably that thing you ordered. I tried, my voice sounding desperate. I don't know what's inside. I didn't look. You're a liar. And a poor one at that. Whatever is inside that box is dangerous, and you are well aware of that. And yet you brought it here anyways. Why is that? Are you an assassin? His eyes flashed with anger, and he picked me up by my collar, lifting me up into the air easily. I realized I had no idea what this man might be capable of, if he even was a man. This was Hollow's End, after all. He could be a sorcerer, or a wizard, or any number of magical beings. What the hell had I been thinking coming inside? I'm not an assassin, I squeaked. I'm just a delivery guy. He looked me in the eye for several long moments, then let me go. Still, I didn't drop for a few seconds. I realized that I was floating a few feet in the air, and almost turned my ankle when I dropped unexpectedly. Give me the address where you picked up the package. That is all I ask. If you provide me with that information, I will let you live. I was about to give him what he wanted when I noticed the box was open, and tipped over on its side, and also empty. Oh, that's not good. He turned around when he saw the look on my face and turned a shade paler. Impossible. I cast a ward on that box to keep it sealed. A scurrying sound could be heard from the kitchen and I realized whatever was inside that box was now loose in the house. Okay, we need to get the hell out of here right now, I said. Those things are evil, I'm pretty sure. I thought you didn't know what was inside the box. I don't, I stammered. Uh, but the lady I got it from, she had all these foot-tall miniatures that were alive. There were soldiers and garden gnomes, and I, I figured it was something like that. She said not to make any stops and acted like it was a top-secret mission or something. 
But then I brought it to the other place, and the, and the guy who told me to bring it here was acting all scared, like it was radioactive or some shit. I was rambling on and on, and couldn't stop talking. But the man seemed to be quite pleased to listen. I realized that cookie was in my hand, and I'd eaten a bite of it before realizing this guy had magic powers. And then I had one more bite after that. What can I say? It was good. What's in these cookies? I asked suspiciously. Oh, the usual. Flour, eggs, sugar, truth serum, chocolate chips, coconut. I spit out the bite in my mouth. Coconut? Dude, that's disgusting. Go on with your story, delivery boy. Call me Jay, will ya? That's about it. I brought the box here, and then you locked me in, and the things got out. Oh. So you really don't know what it is? No. But whatever it was, it sounded like there was more than one. It sounded like there was a whole bunch of them in there. Damn. Alright, I guess I won't kill you then. The creatures you unwittingly brought here are likely stuffed assassins. Undersized, but still deadly commandos. I gawked at him stupidly, then picked up my cup of tea to wash down the rest of the cookie. Uh, don't drink that, it's poison, he said as I brought it to my lips. Now, we'll need to figure out exactly what sort of mini-assassins we're dealing with before trying to dispatch them. Come with me. Can I at least call for help? I asked, pulling out my cell phone. We can get the sheriff over here, or, or Deputy Randy. Which reminds me, running away is also a viable option. We are not going to run. And we're not going to call the cops for a few oversized action figures. I'm sure I can take care of them. All right. I agreed reluctantly, going with him down a short hallway. But you didn't see the face of that dude who sent me here. Mr. Livingstone, he, he was acting like there was a bomb in that box with a very short fuse. Lahart stopped mid-stride in the hallway. Livingstone. Of course he's involved. Come right this way. He started moving again and quickly ushered me into a dark room with a glowing orb at its center. I prefer not to use magic if I don't have to. These things all come with a cost, after all. But I do have one item of great magical power which I was tasked to protect many years ago. Recently, I had a break-in. They were unable to get past my wards and enter this room, but I suspect they found out what was inside. He gestured to the glowing orb, which hovered just above a pedestal in the center of the room. This is what Livingstone is after, I'll wager. He's looking to get his hands on it. Even if it means killing us both. If he's planning on selling it to the highest bidder, I shudder to think what it might mean for the world. We can't let that happen. I stammered, trying to come up with a response as he picked up the glowing orb and handed it to me. I thought you said we were going to be fine. You said you could deal with it. He raised an eyebrow to look at me. Has anyone ever told you that you are extremely gullible? I didn't want to admit it, but I'd heard it a few times. No. Not unless there's money involved. Interesting. Here, take the orb and go, before those tiny assassins get here. If you return it safely to me with a rescue team at your disposal, I will give you, uh, let's say, $500. The option of haggling was tempting, but we were also potentially going to die if I didn't agree with him quickly. I shook his hand glancing up at the wall and seeing a diploma from somewhere called the School of Mystical Arts. The name of the person it was given to was not Lahart, I noticed. It said Ajeti, and I got the feeling he was using an alias. And this man probably had more than one. Deal. I'll be back with help. Just try to survive until then. Uh, those things are dangerous, whatever they are. He opened the window to let me out. I took one last glance at the bespectacled man with the ponytail and thanked him for letting me go. Don't thank me, just run! You need to take that somewhere it'll be safe. Somewhere they won't get their hands on it. And don't tell me where, just go. And bring back help. He shoved me out the window and I rolled awkwardly in the grass as I landed. You know, a 10-15% to 15 tip is customary in addition to the set fee, I yelled, interrupted by the window slamming shut. A moment later, the screaming began, muffled by the window pane. I'm not proud of myself, but I ran. It was what he told me to do, after all. I just hoped the guy would be alright. 
racing back to my car, I got in, setting the glowing orb in the passenger seat. I looked at it for a few seconds, then buckled it in with a seatbelt. It looked like a cute little egg baby, and I wondered if I should have put it in the back or in a car seat in case of an accident. But there was no time for that now, and I didn't own a car seat. I put it in reverse and began to back out of the long driveway. Taking one last glance at the house, I saw a squad of foot-tall miniature soldiers emerging from the front door in battle formation. They were carrying Lahart on their shoulders, standing him up like a trophy. He was tied to a dolly, the, the kind you use to move furniture or heavy boxes. There were so many of them. No wonder that damn box was so heavy. I drove as fast as I could towards downtown Hollow's End. For one of the first times in my life, I was actually going to ask the police for help. I wasn't sure what they were going to do, considering the circumstances, but I needed backup. Parking in front of the sheriff's office, I turned off the car and was about to get out. But then I realized I was being stupid. The toy soldier assassins had seen my car, which meant I needed to hide it. If they saw it out front, they would know exactly where I was. If they were anything like the little bastards in that movie Small Soldiers, they would be tactical and clever. I rewatched it recently and had forgotten how much of a horror vibe it had for a kid's movie. Anyways, now I was living it, so I had to be smart. I drove around the block and parked at the rear of a building several doors down, hoping this would throw them off my trail. I still wanted the car to be close so I could get to it if I needed it. When I went to unbuckle the glowing orb thing, I noticed something strange. It was getting more oblong and egg-like the longer I spent with it. Back at the house, it had looked almost completely spherical and round. Now it was shaped like a vertically stretched out egg. Hmm, that's probably not good, I said, unbuckling it and tucking it beneath my coat. Let's get you inside. I ran around to the entrance at the front of the building and went inside the sheriff's office. Immediately, I was greeted by a friendly face. Grandma? What the hell are you doing here? I work here, Jay, she said from behind the recently constructed counter near the entrance. And watch your language. They needed a hand dealing with all the walk-in traffic. Okay, whatever. Never mind. I need your help. There are some assassins trying to kill me and... Jay, you're being extremely rude. There's someone ahead of you in line. She was right, of course. There was a man in front of me who had gills on his neck as well as webbing between his fingers and toes. His skin was scaly like a fish, and when he turned to scowl at me, I noticed his teeth were sharp and pointed. I took a step back. Sorry, please go ahead. I'll wait. As I tapped my foot impatiently, I couldn't help but notice that the glowing egg was getting more and more elongated beneath my coat. It was starting to look like I was pitching a tent with a deified armpit boner. Finally, they started wrapping things up, and I tried hard not to eavesdrop, but couldn't really help it. Okay, so you'll need to fill out this form, as well as the H-592A, in order to apply for a pond-based dwelling domicile. Bring these back to me as soon as you can, Mr. Aspinall. Please, Bajani is fine. Mm, can I fill these out here? It doesn't look like it will take very long. You absolutely can. Here's a pen... Give it back when you're finished. I just ask that you go have a seat over there so I can help this gentleman who's next in line. He looks like he's in a bit of a pickle. Of course. You've been most helpful. The counter was finally clear, and I approached it with what I hoped was a reproachful look on my face. Really? I couldn't wait two minutes? I was trying to tell you there are assassins coming after me. They're trying to kill me. I need help, Grandma. I looked over her shoulder to see the deputy was sleeping one off in his own personal apartment, the town's solitary jail cell. Hey, Deputy Randy, I need some help. Wake up, man. Good luck, Muriel muttered as I went past her. He's been out cold for twelve hours. He'll need at least three more before he can function properly. That's half the reason they hired me. My eyes searched the bullpen desperately. If you're looking for Sheriff Parsons, he isn't here. He went to go help some people who were being attacked in the forest. No, I'm looking for something else. The sheriff told me to only do this in case of emergency. 
Finally, I found what I was looking for, sitting on the floor beside the sink. The sheriff's trusty bucket. Oh dear. Good luck convincing him to help you after that. Twenty minutes, one cold bucket of water, and one cold, hard slap to my face later, I was on the road with Randy, the sheriff's deputy. He was soaking wet and looked really pissed off. I am so sorry, I tried to say, but he cut me off. Not another fucking word. I'm only helping you because you said there's a citizen of Hollow Zand who's out there in trouble. Now, as soon as we're done helping him, I'm placing you under arrest for dousing a sleeping sheriff's deputy. That's not even a real crime. And anyway, Sheriff Parsons told me to do it, in case of emergency. And you have to admit, this is technically an emergency. I'm gonna get even with you later. And don't try to sweet-talk your way out of this with promises of free liquor deliveries for life. Because I'm not interested. Nobody has suggested that. But you know what? Actually, pull over. Pull over, right here. I'll get out here. Okay, fine. Free deliveries for life. That does not include tips or the price of alcohol. Jeez, between you and Swampy, I'm going to be working for free. Wise decision, knucklehead. Now drive onwards. Let's go save this besieged wizard. To be clear, I never told him the man was a wizard. We arrived at the old house to find it empty. There was no one inside or out. And of course, this made Randy suspicious and angry. Even more than he already was. I believed your ass when you told me there were tiny toy soldiers running around here trying to kill people and steal magical relics. I expected to see some Tommy Lee Jones small soldier shit happening over here. I wanted to stomp little green man under my feet like they obviously should have done throughout that entire movie. And now I find out it's all a lie? For shame, Jay. For shame. Well, looks like you're going to jail after all. Turn around, place your hands behind your back. You have the right to remain stupid. If you choose to waive that right, good luck, because you can't fix dumb. That's what Mama always said, anyways. Wait, I wasn't making it up. It's real. Look. The cardboard box I had brought the toy soldiers in was sitting tipped over on the floor. And inside, there was one broken soldier who I had apparently irreparably damaged during transport, despite my impeccable driving. It was crawling out of the box as if wounded and had a knife in its tiny hand. Kill me, it begged. Terrifying, Randy said, stepping on it. The plastic crunched beneath his feet, and the arms and legs went flying. So this is what you're so scared of? There were like 20 of them. And and they tied up Lahart, and, and he said to get help and come back and, and protect the achy baby. I swear, I'm not making this up. Please, don't take me to jail. I tried to think of where the miniature soldiers would have taken the man, and thought of one other place where he could be. Mr. Livingstone, he, he's the one behind all this. I bet the soldiers took Lahart there. They probably held him at knife point and made him drive. That's why his car isn't here. And why else would he leave his door and windows wide open, especially in this town? Uh, trust me, he's under duress, and that's where they took him. I didn't know this for sure, but was really hoping it was the case. Well, good thing I brought my gun, then. Let's go, delivery boy. Lead the way. I did. Part of me wondering where else his gun would be. Maybe it was better if I didn't know. We arrived at the house on Elm and parked on the street. Immediately, I got the impression that someone was watching us. I could feel eyes on me as I got out of the car, leaving the glowing relic in the back seat. It was starting to look more and more like a staff, a double-sided lightsaber made of soft yellow light. That was when I noticed with alarm that it actually burnt a hole right through the ceiling and floor of my car, the egg growing longer until it surpassed the dimensions of the vehicle. The holes in the metal were red around the edges, fading to black as it cooled. Remind me to keep that thing away from my dick, I muttered. What's that? Nothing. Are you sure this is safe? I feel like this is really dangerous for some reason. I mean, this guy just sent little assassins to kill a guy with magic powers. What's he going to do to us? I'm not too worried about it, Randy said, marching up the walkway towards the front door. I told you this guy's made of stone, right? I called after him, and he spun around 180 degrees and marched back towards me. Seriously, dude? You didn't think to mention that fact? I thought he did. You definitely did not. Shit. 
I think we're going to need some backup. Stone people are tough bastards. What backup? I thought it was just you and Parsons on the force. Eh, we got a few auxiliary folks recently. Uh, LaDonna Spivey, Carrie Harkonnen, some other guy who calls himself Big Joe. I'm going to call them up and see if they can make it out here to help. Uh, keep in mind, they are technically trainees. Randy got on the phone and made a couple quick calls. While he was doing that, I looked around, trying to see if anyone had spotted our arrival. Sure enough, there was someone watching us. Get down! I yelled to the deputy, tackling him and sending him to the ground. A shot fired from the sniper on the roof, who I had seen at the last second. A tiny, miniature assassin with a long-range rifle scope, mounted on a gun almost as big as he was. Judging by the size of him, you wouldn't think it would do much damage. But to my surprise, the car window behind where Randy had been standing smashed with the impact, broken glass landing all around us. What the fuck? Randy yelled, putting the cell phone away. Are those the little green army men? I nodded, grabbing his shirt and pulling him behind the car for cover. Not so harmless anymore, huh? I chided, elbowing him in the ribs. Don't you dare say I told you so. He pulled out his pistol and checked to make sure it was loaded. Satisfied, he racked the slide and got ready to fight. I hate being the responsible one. This is bullshit. I want Parsons back. Well, at least you got those reserve guys. Speaking of which, how long until they get here? Who knows, they're still in training. But at least they're armed. Lahart has to be in that house, being held prisoner. We gotta get him out of there somehow. I owe it to the guy, especially after delivering that box full of mini-assassins to his doorstep. Well, you got any ideas? Because I'm fresh out, Randy said, pulling out a flask and taking a quick swig. Seriously? How can you drink that right? I paused mid-sentence and looked at the flask. Then I snatched it out of his hand. Hey, what the hell are you... He stopped suddenly, looking around at our adversaries. Oh, let me guess, you're going to go all Sylvester Stallone on them and rip off a strip of your shirt, stuff it into the flask, set it on fire, and throw it like a Molotov cocktail? No, I answered, taking a long swig of whiskey. I just really needed a drink. This day's been fucked right from the start. I took another long drink before he snatched it back from me. You son of a bitch, you drank half of it. You shouldn't be drinking anyways, you're an on-duty police officer. Fucking boy scout over here, just like Parsons. Alright, I guess we're just gonna have to wait for backup after all. Randy said as another sniper round fired and shattered another window. Now, this is really important. We might be waiting here for a minute or longer before they arrive. So, while we have some time... I need to ask you. If you were stranded on a desert island, could only bring seven books with you, which ones would you choose? I'll go first. We stayed there for several minutes, discussing how many rations, matches, and survival kits would fit into a hollowed-out physician's reference guide, before we heard a series of gunshots. They were different from the typical ones we'd been hearing for the past few minutes. The ones that had been trying to kill us. Hmm, sounds like our backup might have finally arrived. Randy said, looking around. You want to check and see if that little bastard on the roof is still trying to shoot us? Yes, I mind. That sounds like a great way to get shot. Ugh, so sensitive. Alright, I guess I'll do it myself. He began to construct a makeshift dummy from nearby materials, using his coat with the hood up and a shotgun for the body. Slowly, he began to raise it up, as if one of us were leaning out from behind the car to look around. Meanwhile, gunfire rang out from inside the house. Hmm. Nobody's shooting at us. They're shooting at somebody else, Randy said suddenly. We both got up slowly and looked to see the house lighting up with gunfire from inside. On the roof, a dead toy soldier could be seen with a large hole blown through it. Shit, they better not be. I told them to approach with caution. They're still in training. They could get killed. Randy tossed me the shotgun. Do you know how to use that thing? Not really. Well, you've seen movies. Lock and load, delivery boy. I racked the shotgun. Something I had seen in a million movies. Felt pretty good, I'm not going to lie. Call me delivery man at least, will ya? I'm in my 30s. Never. Come on, let's get in there. Before we could get far, someone emerged from the house. We both took aim and almost fired, but then Randy raised his right hand. Hold fire, that's a friendly. LaDonna? 
What the hell are you doing here? You call me in, boss. Carrie and Big Joe are in there, too. All threats are neutralized. There's no hostage, though. And no stone man, either. You took them all out by yourself? I thought you guys were in training. Well, they're just little toy soldiers. It's not like they're anything scary. She said, crunching another one beneath her boot without a glance, as it tried to sneak up on her from behind. Um, but I'm sure from your position, receiving heavy fire, it must have been quite frightening. We followed her in and discovered she was right about the occupants of the house being gone. The place was empty, aside from all the foot-tall toy soldiers who had been killed. There were a half dozen of them, including the one on the roof, meaning at least a dozen more were still out there somewhere. And we had seen how deadly they could be. Found this in the office, sir, a very tall man with broad shoulders said to Randy, entering the living room. He was holding a check in his hands with a lot of zeros on it. I could tell even from where I was standing. Good work, Big Joe. Randy took the check and examined it. Of course. Who else in this town wants nothing more than power? And we'll do nothing to stop it getting it. Ah, oh, don't tell me. He turned the check around to show it to me. My heart froze ice cold in my chest and I suddenly forgot how to breathe. Quest Bakeries was a known front for the Subterraneans. They sold bread downtown, but nobody actually went there. Mostly because the bread was made of bugs, but also because everyone hates those guys. Still, they paid the rent on time, and no one could ever prove that they were just using the bakery as a front for illegal operations, but almost everyone knew that was the case. Another man entered the room, holding his phone in his hands and covering the receiver. I keep trying the sheriff, but he's not answering. I know, Carrie, he's out helping some tourists out in the... Randy paused, realizing the significance of it suddenly. Forest. He's in the forest with the subterraneans. What the hell is all this? What the hell are they planning? I get a bad, sinking feeling in my gut. Pulling out my phone, I dialed the sheriff's office. It just rang and rang and rang with no answer. Oh no, they got Muriel. What? How do you know that? Trust me, this is all to get us back. They're still pissed at us for what happened before. Yeah, she killed one of their oldest giant millipedes. The thing was basically a god to them. They've been waiting for just the right moment to come for us, and this is it. This is all about getting me and my grandma back for what we did. We all stood silently for a moment before Carrie finally broke the silence by asking, So, are we just going to stand here? Or are we going to go save them? When we arrived at the entrance to the forest, I was surprised to see Sheriff Parsons there, along with Muriel and Blarian, the woman who I picked up the tiny toy soldier assassins from. As we approached, one of the same toy soldiers who had just been trying to murder us came out from the trees. Randy saw it around the same time I did, and the two of us ran towards them, screaming at them to run. Clearly, they didn't notice it preparing to attack them. Look out! One of those little bastards is coming for you! Randy yelled, drawing his pistol. Get back! I'm gonna blow its tiny plastic face off! Kill it! Kill it! Kill it! I heard someone screaming in a shrill voice, and realized it was me. Meanwhile, the toy soldier looked completely passive, staring at us as if we were no threat at all. It had a piece of paper in its hands, not a gun, and it wasn't trying to kill anyone. Stop! What is the meaning of this? Blarian shouted, picking up the little soldier and cradling it against herself. These are my personal guardians. They're not dangerous. They don't do anything unless they are told to do so by their owner. We skidded to a stop like a couple of stunned cartoon characters, unsure what to say. But, but, those things just tried to kill us, Randy stuttered, still holding his gun. I even had to sit behind a car like a chump, waiting for backup while these guys had all the fun and got to shoot things. He hooked his thumb over his shoulder at Carrie, LaDonna, and Big Joe. They shrugged and mumbled a half-hearted apology, looking sheepish. Sorry, boss, we should have left some of them for you to kill, Big Joe said, wringing his hands. We'll be more considerate next time. How did you not realize that these were part of the Blarian 50? Sheriff Parsons asked Randy, his hands on his hips. You've lived in this town longer than I have, 
And even I know that these are Blarian's elite handcrafted guardsmen who can be rented out for protection services. But if they malfunction and try to kill you, all you have to do is call Blarian. And then she'll come right over and fix everything. How did you not think to call her? Randy turned his angry gaze on me. I thought you said Mr. Livingstone sent you to that house. He did. After I picked up the mini assassins from Blarian. Someone must have whispered to them in the driveway when I stopped there, like sending them on a secret mission to kill the heart. I told you not to make any stops, Blarian said. That place was supposed to be your only destination. I was very explicit about that for this precise reason. Muriel came over, wagging her finger. Now, Jay, how could you kill Blarian's guardians? It isn't their fault some middleman coerced them to kill a mystical wardcaster to steal his... She raised an eyebrow. Y you do have the golden egg, correct? How do you know any of this? And yes, of course I still have it. It's right... My eyes widened. It was in the backseat of my car. I ran back to grab it and found the glowing egg had reshaped itself once again, forming itself into a sword, which was a perfectly reasonable length. I picked it up and it felt warm but comfortable to the touch. As I was about to turn around, something caught my eye. Looking past the car, into the neighborhood adjacent to the forest, I saw a storm front was rolling in. Huge, dark clouds filled with thunder and lightning that was flashing... green? Strange, but no time to think about that now. Racing back to rejoin the group, I waved the glowing sword over my head. Got it. It was at that exact moment that I noticed the sun was setting. We had been at this all day, and I hadn't bothered to check the time. As I opened my mouth to scream a warning at the others, the ground began to shake. It's getting dark. We need to get out of here, I yelled to the others. We can come back in the morning when those giant millipedes aren't feeding. I wish it were that simple, Parsons said, pointing straight into the forest. It looks like they've tied up Lahart. They're using him as bait. Not just him, either, Muriel said, and I noticed the giant stone-skinned man tied up next to him. It was Livingstone. Well, that'll teach him to work with those slimy bastards. But he definitely doesn't deserve to be eaten by a millipede and digested for a hundred years. Nobody deserves that shit. I've recalled my soldiers... Blarian said. You'll have them at your disposal, but we need to move now, before the big ones start to come up to feed. Sheriff Parsons drew his gun. Okay, everybody ready? We looked around at each other and nodded. Sheriff Parsons, Randy, Muriel, Big Joe, Carrie, LaDonna, and not to mention Blarian and her many soldiers were all ready to attack, holding weapons in their hands. Oh, there was also me. On my mark... Three, two, one. Charge! At that moment, our small army invaded the forest. Literally, a lot of the tiniest soldiers I'd ever seen were suddenly running alongside us, appearing out of nowhere. I guess they had been hiding in the trees. We were only about ten yards into the woods when the ground began to break open in places, and the horrifying maws of mutant millipedes started to emerge from the dirt between trees. Within moments, they were crawling everywhere. More and more were coming out of the ground with each passing second. As I raced past a tree, one emerged from behind it and sprung at me, showing its sharp, slimy teeth, its jaws unhinged to attack. I swung the glowing sword in my hand without a thought, only instinct, slicing through its face horizontally and splitting its head down the middle. The cauterized edges of the wound reminded me of the damage a lightsaber would inflict and I suddenly understood why the Subterraneans wanted this magical item so badly. It was fucking badass. Holy shit, dude, Randy said, stopping in his tracks. He offered me his gun with wide eyes. Trade ya. Nah, I'm good, I said, spinning around to lop off another millipede's head, as its mouth opened wide with sharp teeth bared to bite me. Bastard. He took a few shots with his gun, blasting giant holes in the bodies of the mutant insects. It took me all of three seconds to catch on to his attempts at being Tom Sawyer. Man, this gun is so much fun to shoot. Die, 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 you millipede sons of bitches. Hooey, I wouldn't give up this fabulous firearm in a million years. That's right, sir. I'd like to be buried with this gun. 
Unless you wanted to... Still no. Mm, fine, selfish bastard. We approached the two men tied to chairs, which were secured to trees behind them. They were both shaking their heads desperately, as if telling us not to come any further. Of course, we ignored them. As soon as I took the gag out of Lahart's mouth, he yelled, Run! It's a trap! But of course, it was too late. As the last person joined the group, the ground all around us began to move, raising upwards. It took me a second to realize it was a giant net. It had been camouflaged to blend into the ground all around us, covered with dead leaves and dry sticks and grass to make it look like the forest floor. The whole group of us were suddenly lifted up off the ground and trapped in the largest net I'd ever seen. The trap was being pulled up by huge millipedes far off in the forest, out of sight until this moment. A sound of laughter could be heard then, as we struggled against the netting. A group of hooded figures came into view below us, and I realized who was making that laughing noise. Fucking subterraneans. A tall woman strode into view first. She uncovered her face, dropping down the hood which had shrouded her visage in darkness. Her acolytes surrounded her on all sides, and more of them emerged from the woods by the second. Soon there was a throng of them, at least fifty or more, standing below us and watching us dispassionately. Today is your long-awaited judgment day, the tall woman said as we struggled in the netting. You have each proven yourselves to be enemies of the subterraneans. You have wronged us in so many ways. And so it is fitting that you all brought each other here. We could have never lured you into the woods like this not for your affection for each other. Your love for one another is what has doomed you. Now, prepare to suffer and die like the infinitesimal worms. Is she fucking serious right now? Randy said, looking at me. Dude, you're holding a fucking lightsaber. What are you... Now, Jay, use the thing. I suddenly realized what he meant and that I was holding the exact thing that we needed to get out of this mess. The glowing sword in my hand had been completely overlooked by the subterraneans, even though they ostensibly knew of its existence. And I was once again reminded of just how dumb they were. Turning the blade in my hand, I sliced through the netting like warm butter, quickly making a hole that miniature soldiers fell out from. I kept cutting, and pretty soon gravity did the rest, sending the group of us tumbling out from the net. The group of us stood to our feet, looking the trembling subterraneans dead in the eyes. Oh, hell, the tall woman said, turning around and running quickly in the opposite direction. Her acolytes followed after her, looking over their shoulders at us to see if we would follow them. And we didn't. This merely left us with the problem of roughly a hundred giant millipedes, with more joining them by the second, who were rapidly surrounding us to feast on our still living corpses. Uh, what now? I asked, looking at Sheriff Parsons. We can't take all these things. Not with just us. Good thing it isn't just us, he said, winking at me. The ground was suddenly trembling again, and I wondered if it was more millipedes rising to the surface. It turned out it wasn't. I called for backup. Who? Randy asked. The recruits are already here. I saw then who he had called for help. Entering the forest, raising their voices in a war cry, was the entire town of Hollow's End. Every citizen ranging from aliens to monsters to humans, and everything in between. Mark from Earth, Mamakato, Frank, Diane Showers, and the Crimson Muse. With the Butcher leading them at the head of the front line, they were mowing down millipedes and hacking them to pieces as the creatures lunged and attacked. The huge, many-legged monsters were not allowing these intruders into the forest without a fight. They were attacking them without mercy. But the citizens of Hollow's End had been through this before. It wasn't the first time they'd had to fight to preserve the safety of their town. And it wasn't the first time they'd had to call the denizens of the forest, after the subterraneans had become too brazen. They were making a path for us to escape, to regroup at the edge of the forest, and we quickly made our way towards them to get away. 
it wasn't easy, as the monsters were now everywhere, and more were emerging from the ground with every passing second. As a rule of thumb, the later you stayed in the woods in Hollow's End, the bigger the monsters were who emerged from the ground. It was now fully dark outside, and the millipedes burrowing up from the dirt were as long as city buses. I saw many of the miniature soldiers get crushed by the onslaught of enormous millipedes, but others put up a hell of a fight, with one small squadron of them saving me from an attack at the last second that would have likely taken out my throat, as a millipede the size of a Rottweiler nearly tackled me. Within a few minutes, we were back near the forest entrance, where the butcher and Frank and a cadre of others were waiting. I was leading the charge, slicing the creatures from stem to stern and leaving cauterized pieces of flesh and pools of green slimy blood in my wake. As we got within reach of the others, suddenly something huge emerged from the ground, blocking our path and sending me flying up into the air, sailing into the branches of the trees above. The wind was knocked out of me and it took me a few seconds to realize what had just happened. I was now way up in the air, above the tops of the highest trees, hanging precariously from the face of the biggest millipede I'd seen in quite some time. It was the size of a subway train, and was maneuvering its mouth to try to flip me inside like a dangling cheese curd on some problematic poutine. A blur of grey streaked past me to my right and I saw it was Mr. Livingstone. He was climbing up the body of the millipede with the speed and grace of a spider. I wouldn't have thought he was capable of that, considering his size, and the fact that he was made of stone. The giant millipede apparently didn't notice him at first, as it was focused on me, its potential dinner. But as Livingstone reached the creature's face and began to bash it with his fists, he became more of an apparent threat. The monster reeled backwards, thrashing and bucking to get the interloper off, but Livingstone held firmly onto it, digging his rocky hands into the flesh of the creature and tearing off its scales, leaving gooey green cheese strands behind. Finally, Livingstone managed to grab hold of me and raked his stony hand down the belly of the beast, slowing our descent as we came crashing back down to the ground. It wasn't a graceful landing, but I survived the fall, and Livingstone looked somewhat pleased at that fact. Thanks, big guy, I said, shaking as I got up from my knees. You saved my life. It was the least I could do, Livingstone replied. I still have a long way to go to make up for my mistakes today, but I hope this is a start. I should have never trusted those subterranean pieces of shit. I hope one day you can forgive me for that. The ground was splitting beneath our feet, and we all shuffled and ran to get out of the way. Let's save the apology party for after we're out of the death forest, shall we? Randy said, waving us all towards the clearing. We managed to escape the forest, thanks to the help of nearly everyone in town. The millipedes knew better than to advance beyond the borders of the woods, and didn't follow us much further. Those who did were cut down quickly and without mercy. To stay alive, they needed to stay together, and that meant staying within the boundaries of the forest. As we all stood in the field outside the woods, covered in mud and blood and counting our losses, I looked up again to see the storm clouds which were rolling into town. The clouds were moving so, so slowly. And that lightning, flashing green like the Incredible Hulk. Well, I would say we hit the subterraneans now while they're at their weakest, Sheriff Parsons said, looking at the sky. But I'm starting to think we've got other problems right now. What the hell is up with that cloud? It don't look right, Randy muttered. Thank you for returning this to me safely, a voice said from behind me, and I turned to see Lahart was there, with his hand extended. I owe you a debt of thanks. I realized he wanted the glowing egg thing, which was now a glowing sword. Sad to part with it, I began to hand it over to him, but then stopped. Wait a second. You owe me more than a debt of gratitude. You said you'd give me 500 bucks for keeping it safe and bringing it back to you. Cough up the cash, man. I've been through hell for this thing. Yeah, Randy said, backing me up. And I get 10%. No, I corrected. You already get free liquor deliveries, remember? Oh, yeah. Lahart looked worried. I, uh, don't have that sort of cash on me. That's a lot of money, and... I took the sword back, keeping it in my possession. No payment? No problem. I'll just hang on to this for collateral. 
until you can get it to me. He started arguing, but then a loud murmuring sound began to rise up from the townspeople all around us. The green-tinged cloud was nearly overhead, and it was just beginning to rain. As the raindrops hit the ground, strange things began to burst from the soil. Plants that looked alive and hungry. Screams erupted from everywhere, and a mad panic overtook the crowd as people began to jostle and push each other. And then, a stampede broke out. It had been a long day in Hollow's End. But, as it turned out, it wasn't over yet. Alright everybody, that's it for this installment of Hollow's End. I hope you all will join us next time, where we'll find out what happens next. There's a few people I'd like to thank for making this possible today. Mark from Earth. Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Zwall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamacato, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blarian 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajetti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, Big Joe, Carrie Harkonnen, LaDonna Spivey, they're the new recruits, Scott Tanaka, Tom Stewart, Sherman Davis, Bryce Shelton, Susan McClendon, Elise Batiste, Lisa in the Cult Jam, Open Circuit, Fabulavore, Raymond Jaggers, That Darn Fox, Raison Detra, Kai Gaming 99, Wendy Burns, The Wendigo, Michael Squishy Park, The Jam Star, Vault 77 Citizen, Puppy Dan, Clovis Wolf, Elder Jelm, Derek Prey, Elder Bean and Casey Hawaii, Rob T, Tragic Mermaid, Darren Fishnaller, Cloves and Oi Harris, Roe Underwood, Florida Man Luke, Bethany's Mom, Winter's Kiss, Sam Brooke, The White Stag and Corgi Connection, No Name, Marta Cara, Professor Elm and Kathy Barrickman, Cybard Sands, Steve Hennessy, Melanie Sanders, The Archivist, Rob Smith and Term 4, Naz Razio, J. David Wellman Jr., Parker Lewis, Monica Moya, D. Master 311, Britt the Alchemist, Taylor the Fox, and Holly Haworth. If you want to become a citizen of Hollow's End like these folks and appear in a story in the future, well, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. Thanks everybody for listening to tonight's story. If you want to hear the origins of J. the Delivery Guy, well, Click on a little link in the bottom right-hand corner that's going to be coming up on your screen in a moment. All right. That's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great night.